We're living in the 21st century. Um, Technology is changing every day. Businesses are growing, scaling really quickly. And for me, many businesses are turning to Agile. They are starting to think about how to adopt it, not just within a technology aspect, but more from a, an organizational um, aspect. So, I mean, why do you think it's important for companies or businesses to take this approach? I think you've kind of almost answered your own question there in a way by saying things are changing. And the faster things change, the more complexity there is, the more uncertainty there is, the less, the less you can actually rely on predicting the future. You have to run with it. Um, companies have spent a lot of time and energy in the past trying to protect themselves from change. And it's, it's, a, it's a waste of energy that could be better spent actually putting, harnessing that change, yeah. being at the forefront of that change. Um, it's, it's, it used to be a competitive advantage to be agile. Now it's companies are adopting it to keep up. Um, it, it's really a case of if you're not, you can't get to market quick enough. You can't respond quick enough. You can't keep your customers because other, 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 your competitors are more agile. Um, it's, it's, it's the new norm. Yeah, I agree. I think, I mean, certainly in my, throughout my experience and time working with, with many different companies, I've, I've found that it has brought about so many benefits. Um, you talk about speed to market. I think in this day and age, if you're not out there, it's not quick enough your company very much could cease to exist to a certain degree. I mean, it's, it's, you, there's, there's so much competition out there. If you think about the big players, for example, I mean, we're, we're always being, companies are always being compared to Facebook and Amazon and Google and these companies that are really uh, putting new things out there very quickly. And they're not even perfect. No. They're, they're just ideas that they put out into the, into the world. And what I always really sort of find quite interesting is they, they put a new idea or product out there, they see what happens with it and then they adapt to that, they get that feedback quickly and they go, oh, our customers aren't using it this way, they're using it this way. And I think that for me is what uh, Agile has the advantage of really bringing out, bringing out from certain organisations. So earlier you mentioned that Agile isn't just about technology yeah. and it isn't just about tech teams, it's also, um, it can be very beneficial for other departments or other teams within organizations. In your experience, how, how do you think that Agile can be useful for other departments and organizations that aren't just focused on technology? Yeah, I'm, it's, it's, it's a big thing for me because I'm not really a software, I don't really have a software background. So it's, it's obviously got attached in the software world, but it's, its history is, is from car manufacturing, so completely outside of that. But it, it, it got a, a software label, partly because of the Agile Manifesto, but also because the software industry was so ripe for the benefits, the conditions were, were completely appropriate. Unknown and highly changing requirements, technology changing rapidly, customer needs not really being understood. So it's, it's about, is there uncertainty in what you're doing? Is there complexity in what you're doing? Can things change? Mm. There, if, if those things are rife, then you can get benefits from inspecting and adapting, doing something small, getting some value, and then going again. And it's interesting you say that because a lot of the time I also find that when we talk about getting things done, complexity, that th there tends to, you need a certain level of organization around that as well in yeah. terms of uh, how you plan, how you understand, how, how, you know, what are your requirements or what are the things you need to get done. Um, my experience has been that I often, I often get approached by different teams within companies saying, can you help us with even just understanding the list of things we need to do? Yeah. Um, and then that sort of leads on to understanding what are the top priorities and understanding things like the value that, we're, that we need to sort of really bring about within our team to help the organisation or help our department. So I, I, I mean, my personal experience has been helping a lot of marketing teams within organisations and helping finance teams or helping um, other teams that are not necessarily, you know, tech or um, code driven. So I, I find that really interesting and, and I find that that's grown quite a lot throughout the last, certainly for me, the last couple of years of, of being an agile coach, being a scrum master and really sort of trying to help different people in different parts of the organisation. <laughs> If we think about organisations, because we've been talking about loads of different departments in an organisation, you've got your tech department, marketing, finance, there could be a number of departments. And 
when it comes to thinking about an organization as a whole, we often tend to um, have these departments that can be quite siloed. Uh, and I think it's, I mean, it's great that all of the different departments have obviously their, their aims, their goals, but what happens when we want to bring those departments together? Because at the end of the day, organizations are organizations in its entirety, in its holistic form, and we are always striving to achieve a particular vision, a goal for that organization. How can Agile help break down such silos, in your opinion? How does Agile help? It forces it. Um, you can't deliver end-to-end -end value unless you're starting to at least blur those boundaries, or if not, break them down. Um, if not, then I mean, a really easy example that I often give people, one of the first big projects that we started, um, we had to try and get a cross-functional team together. Uh, we knew that, but we had all these different departments. So we had the designers over there that had their lead designer that, who was in charge of that department, uh, all their management structure. We had the business analysts over here, they had their management structure, and the developers and the testers and the, you know, the architects and all these different departments. In order to get something of value, we had to get someone from over there, someone from over there, someone from over there into that team. Um, and we did quite well, but there was one group that was just too busy, just too much work. And to be honest, they probably weren't that interested in being part of what we were doing. They just wanted to focus on getting it, being efficient in how they do it. So that was, that was the systems integration testing team, right? So we got all these people together and in a month, we got something done. Uh, and we effectively, metaphorically, this is knocked on the door of systems integration testing and said, can you test this? You know, we've built this. And they said, yeah, yeah, sure. We, we could test that for you. Uh, take about a month. Um, <laughs> come back in a month and we'll have tested it. I said, all right, fair enough. We'll go away and build something else. You test that. You're busy, we're busy. We're all adding value, happy days. So we go away, build something else, come back in a month. Uh, we've built this, can you test it for us? And they said, yeah, 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 sure. Uh, it takes about a month. Uh, oh, by the way, here's what we've tested last month. Or the, this is what we tested and what you built last month. And here's all the list of problems. It's not going anywhere near live until you fix this, 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 and this. Okay, all right. You test that, we'll fix these problems. Deal. You're busy, we're busy, happy days. So we go away, fix the problems, they're testing the new stuff. We come back at the end of the month, we've uh, we fixed it, uh, can you check we fixed it? Yeah, 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 takes about a month. Um, oh, and here's all the list of stuff from last month, you go fix that, we'll, we'll check this. Okay, deal. Uh, so we thought we were delivering value in a month, yeah. but actually we weren't, we were delivering value in four months. And so we were knocking on this team's door every you know, month for us to build it, a month for them to check it, a month for us to fix the problems, and a month for them to check we fix the problems. And ev every month we were knocking on the door. And eventually they said, oh, gee, come on. Oh, Christina, just go and work with these guys. We show them how it's done. They're awful at testing. So we annoyed them into breaking down that silo. And we got Christina in our team who could now show us how to get stuff done so that when we knock on their door, we know it works. Um, and I'm not suggesting that you go out there and annoy people into breaking down these silos, but it, that, that visibility of, we think we're doing things in a month, but actually it's four times the length of it. And that's just one handoff. Mm -hmm. If you've got three or four handoffs, the cycle time is, well, you check that bit, we'll do it. It's huge. Yeah. And just making that visible, that's the first thing really, is making visible the actual length of the value stream to get something out the door. And people are always shocked because everyone's busy Everyone's delivering in short iterations, but the actual value takes ages to get out the door. What do you think are the important steps when it comes to embedding or adopting Agile within an organization? And how, 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 how would you encourage organizations to start that journey? So in terms of actually you know, where to start within an organization, I, I find there's typically two schools of thought at either end of the spectrum. One is Pick the easiest place to start, get some momentum, get some confidence, pick the most comfortable place to start. So when we're talking about anxiety and uncertainty, it's kept to a minimum. And you'd be surprised, everywhere that I've been, an organisation leader says, I think we should, we should be more agile as a company. They've always got some pockets of agility there somewhere, because someone somewhere in the organisation has thought, there's got to be a better way, and they're just doing it. Almost, yeah. almost screw the official policy, if you like. So that's, that's a good place to start because it's, it's easy and you can build on it, low hanging fruit. The other school of thought is pick the riskiest, most difficult, most challenging, the scariest project, the most complicated project that you've got and start there, uh, which usually gets a whoa kind of response. But really, if you start with the easiest project, 
anyone who's skeptical about this would think, well, of course it would work there. Well, that was going to work anyway, regardless. Yeah. Uh, what have you learnt? Whereas if you pick the riskiest project, you're going to find out where your problems are organisationally, structurally, systemically, a lot quicker. Yeah. And those are the projects that you can't afford to fail, really. The easy ones, not really going to cause much of an issue either way. But it takes a lot more courage to do that. And it, that's where you sort of get a feel for how what appetite there is within an organisation, how courageous they are, and where they do you want to jump in the deep end or, or wade in from the shallow end. Uh, so if I, if I was a leader of an organisation and somebody said, okay, well, you need to change the way you do things, completely restructure your silos and everything, I'd be scared. Absolutely, all right? yeah. Um, and so I'd want someone who can, who can help me avoid some big mistakes, some big catastrophes, and someone who's been through that, even if it's a different context, even if it's a different organisation. Because every organisation is the same, yet different, then some of those, some of those things you can sort of preempt. Yeah, you can sort of think, oh, well, this is going to happen. You can almost prepare yourself for it. But any, any change agent worth their salt would, would be open and honest enough to to say to a leader in an organisation that things are going to go wrong, as it were. And part of this is actually dealing with failure. It's, it's creating, stop trying to spend all your energy avoiding failure. Put your energy into creating an organisation and a culture that can actually take failure and cope with it. They, the company doesn't break, right? And eventually you can use that failure for a positive. You can actually take a product that fails, for example, and use that knowledge to turn it into a product that succeeds, rather than trying to create the product that doesn't fail in the first place. Um, so there's an element of, yes, I've done this before, and I can help you avoid catastrophe, but actually failing and learning is part of the journey. In your opinion, what, what for you are the main benefits, um, but as well as the benefits, the, the challenges that organisations can come across when it comes to starting that journey and certainly uh, having, having been on that journey for a good, for, for a while. The most common benefits that organisations will get from an agile approach, predictability, um, speed, quality, uh, morale. So depending on where you are, so most companies are focused on speed. Yeah. Um, but if you just focus on speed, then you can get really, really quick and you can get really, really fast at delivering the wrong thing. So for me, before you start worrying about getting quick, is deliver the right stuff. Um, and so that involves a lot of collaboration across different parties. If you're being really simplistic about it, we need to collaborate between the people who, who want something and the people who are doing it. And making sure that the people who are doing it have an understanding of why, and the people who want understand why understand the how, and that they can iterate together to actually evolve something, emerge something. And even at this really simplistic level of a, a, a product development team and users collaborating, that's going to be quite tricky. You, people do like it, all right, because you can actually, if you've got an idea, you can see it coming to life quicker, you can, you can shape it easier. Um, and if you're doing something, you actually know that you're doing something valuable and you get feedback on a regular basis. So there are advantages to that at the personal level as well as the organizational level. But we shouldn't underestimate the difficulties there because if, I'm, if I've just been given a list of things to do and I just go on working on them, then that's kind of easy. Um, I don't have to get feedback on something that I've, I've started. I don't have to be told that that's not quite right, change it. Um, so I'm opening myself up to information messages that I might rather avoid for a while absolutely and I and I think that and again this is my personal experience for me that's at the heart of it all um, people organizations are about people and it doesn't matter whether you're working in an agile way or whether you know more traditional approaches are better suited to that organization if people aren't working together and really understanding what they're delivering, then it's almost like, what's the point? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that you touch on a really important element there, which is about people and, and a certain level of trust and empowerment that it also takes to, um, to really change this kind of mindset and ways of working, especially in that shift from tra traditional approaches to agile. Um, 
And that's hard. For me, that's, that's a, quite a big challenge, uh, especially in a very big organisation. You know, you're expecting a lot from people around sort of changing how they, how they lead, how they communicate, how they work together. And, and I, I find that that can be quite tough. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's a phrase that is a good phrase, but it's a scary phrase. And so sometimes it does more harm than, than good. And that is, you can use an agile approach to fail fast. Um, and there's, there's a lot behind it. But if you just hear the phrase, agile is going to make you fail fast, that can scare people. Well, I don't want to fail at all, yeah. uh, let alone failing fast. But failing fast is definitely a lot more preferable to failing slow. Because if you fail slow, that's really expensive. And when you've, you've put a lot of effort and a lot of time in to, only end, to end up with a failed project, a failed product, that's really demoralizing. But if you've only put a small amount of effort in and you realize it's going wrong, it's quite cheap. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot easier, both organizationally and psychologically at a personal level, to pivot and change. Um, so failure is a downside to an agile approach, but it's also a benefit. But it, so at a leadership level, getting, getting used to the fact that actually we're going to embrace failure, failure is going to be a good thing as long as we fail cheaply and as long as we yeah. fail quickly. And as long as we learn from that failure so we don't continually refail the same way, um, that it, it's a double-edged coin, as they say. For me, there's a really powerful part of Agile which sometimes I find not many organizations explore, and that's the continuous learning aspect of it. Um, we hear a lot of buzzwords, continuous improvement, continuous delivery, um, but for me, there's, there's, there's something really, um, really powerful to, to explore there, um, especially when it comes to the learning aspect, mm -hmm. um, and that touches things like failing fast and feedback. Um, what are your thoughts on organizations and agile and this idea that um, empowering people to learn and to 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 really sort of build upon that learning and, and explore ideas and, and innovate. Mm -hmm. It's rare that you'll get me to say something very definitive but I'm going to be quite definitive I know, here. I know you. <laughs> if, if you're not learning you're not agile. That, that's, that's probably the most definitive I'll ever be. Yeah. Um, and it, it, I'm passionate about that. It's, it's, one of the, it's one of the principles of the Agile Manifesto. It just so happens to be right down the bottom. But it's, it's, you know, you've got to take advantage of the opportunity that you're giving yourself to learn. By doing something small and quick, you're learning. You're learning whether you're doing the right thing. You're learning whether you're doing it in the right way. You're learning whether it's going to be valuable. Um, you're learning how you're going to go about doing things and how you can get better at doing them. The, the, all those opportunities are there. Now, I'm a believer that actually learning is, is one of the things that acts as a motivator for human beings. We, we're curious as a species. We, we want to get better at things. We like to expand our skill sets and learn new things. So the fact that there's an intrinsic motivation in, built into the agile way of working is a good thing. So it should happen. However, I also see it as an obligation. Mm. If you're not taking time out to reflect and adapt, you can just be building the same thing and you're, 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 you're Abdicate, abdicating your responsibility, if you like, to, to get better at things. Not just what you're building, but how you're building it. So that we have the opportunity at the end of every iteration to get some feedback about what we're doing. Okay, it might not be comfortable to learn that it's not perfect, uh, but it's an opportunity to get better. And we have an opportunity to work out how to get better at how we're doing it. Uh, and again, that might not be comfortable to learn that I can improve in a certain area but it's a good feeling when we do improve in that area. Um, I don't know, how, how have you, it's obviously important to you as well, so how have you got into that habit yourself? From a personal perspective? Yeah. So for me, um, I, I always say that you never stop learning and it's probably not just me that says that, but every opportunity is, is an opportunity to learn. And I think I've, from my own experience, um, I inspect and adapt on a regular basis for myself as a coach, as a, as a scrum master. I'm always constantly asking for feedback of how did this go? How did, uh, was that meeting facilitated in, in the best way possible? Could I have done something better? I think it's not just about um, teams, it's also about individuals. Um, but this idea that feedback 
and, and learning and taking that feedback and improving yourself, improving your skills, improving the capabilities of a team. It's, it's, it's such a valuable, powerful aspect of Agile that I just think it's so, it's so um, underrated. And um, one of the things that I am very passionate about and I, and I tend to, to drive in organizations that I've worked in certainly is um, this idea that you know we have communities of practice where we, we we carve out space to also learn. So if if you're working in 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 such a way, for example, if you're using Scrum, naturally that's a there's a built-in retrospective that allows you to stop and, and inspect and adapt and reflect on the past iterations. But some frameworks don't necessarily have that built in. So how how do you carve out that time? And I think that's another question that you know when you're transitioning um, from traditional approaches to Agile, or even just generally asking ourselves as companies, how are we learning? Mm. Uh, what are the areas you want to try and change and improve? I think it's important to note that management is still an important part of any company, because at the end of the day, when we're thinking about vision and direction, you know, we, we need our leaders and our managers to really steer. Well, that's leadership. Absolutely, yeah. yeah which is different, because if, I, if I've got good leadership, mm. then I can be much more effective at self-managing. Yeah. And if I'm, if I'm effective at self-managing, I need less management, which leaves a lot more room for these traditional managers to be more leadership, yeah. to do more leadership, to provide more leadership. They, they don't have to worry about, are you working properly, are you doing the right thing, are you coming in on time, because I know they're delivering. And in an agile environment I can see that delivery quite easily and quite quickly on a regular basis. So I don't have to manage by timesheet, I can manage by delivery. And I suppose if there's a problem with delivery, you, you, you're able to sort of see that very quickly and, and change how we're delivering as opposed to necessarily trying to manage that or control that, because I find that often if there's a problem in, in you know, are we are we delivering the right thing or is delivery quite slow? Well, delivery could be slow because we're not understanding what we need to deliver. And for me, that's more about facilitating the conversation. And I feel that's where a coach or a scrum master, uh, if, if you're working with a scrum framework, for example, comes in because they can facilitate that conversation mm -hmm. as opposed to managing and making decisions within that conversation, which yeah. can come from a bit more controlled management. So just to summarise, mm. if you were to pick your top three reasons why a company should adopt Agile, what would they be? Um, okay, so not necessarily in order, but I would say getting optimum return on your investment. So finding out where the value is, doing more of that, and doing less of the stuff that doesn't add you value, and getting that value sooner. Uh, the second one I would say would be around innovation and responding to change. So getting into a habit and creating a culture of being responsive and trying new things and working out what does work and what doesn't work. And then the third I would say would be making the most of the people that you have in your organisation. Um, harnessing their talent, their innovation, their creativity, their passion uh, and their intrinsic motivations. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can't... I can't disagree with any of those. I think if I were to pick my top three, they'd pretty much be spot on. I'd say it's about people, it's about value and resilience. Yeah, absolutely. That's probably better saying it than, than how I say it. <laughs> hey, it's uh, summarising it, but yeah, no, it's, it's good to know we're on the same page. <laughs>